matters of which we're dealing. And since probably almost everybody was here this morning, there are questions regarding that. I said that this was this afternoon. I had trouble figuring which one I wanted to get into. Uh, they are connected. I like to think this afternoon may be laying more foundation work, not only for what we studied this morning, but for a number of other things. I want to read this to you. It's a little bit... Uh, if, in other words, you'll probably, because it's a syllogism, have maybe more trouble remembering it, but you get the gist of it. And I'll read it to you, and then we'll come back to it later on. I may read it several times, not in this sermon, but in later times. Major premise. Faithful elders must watch over the souls of all Christians and the church under their oversight in all things pertaining to life and godliness. Minor premise. Bill and Betty are married Christians in a church under the oversight of a faithful eldership. Conclusion. Therefore, Bill and Betty are souls that must be watched over in all things pertaining to life and godliness by the elders of the church where they are members. That's only one. But it's how you try to figure, am I reasoning correctly? Remember, we're commanded. It's not a matter of whether you want to or not. If you're going to be faithful, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Truth, by its very nature, is propositional. A propositional statement makes a claim. The scriptures teach that baptism is a burial in water. That's a propositional statement. It's a statement, period. So it's either true or it's false. That's also the nature of truth because uh, of the law of the excluded middle. There's no middle ground. Baptism is a burial in water or it's not. And any truth can be stated that way. Now, you have to start checking your thinking out relative to what does the Bible teach as you've rightly divided it. And to do that, to make practical applications in our daily lives, there has to be some process you go through in your mind. Because think for a minute, this book was written almost 2,000 years ago in a language, at least the New Testament part of it, in a language that we don't speak for the most part, in a technology that we don't have anymore, in a culture that we don't live anymore, but human beings are human beings as God created them, and they all work the same way. As far as the way we take in information, the way we reason with it, and the conclusions that we draw. There's ways to check to whether we're thinking correctly, or as one fellow said, thinking straight. One of those is what's called the Aristotelian syllogism that I've just used. It's a way you can check. Now, propositional truth means you can put all truth in a propositional statement. You can reason with it just like I did. And you can draw conclusions. Now, of course, it comes back to what does the Bible say? What does Jesus command? What does he authorize? And his will is in his words, and we have to understand the word. So, since we use translations, then many times we go back to the Greek to see what the Holy Spirit actually said. But that involves understanding that word as it was used in the common Greek, Koine Greek of the first century. Now, a lot of us never get to where I said right here, except I think diligent students will all try to do something to find out just what does my God want me to do today? How do I handle this situation today? There was no internet back there. Does therefore the Bible have a thing in the world to say about my conduct and my proper use or improper use of the internet? Certainly it does. Because truth is like that. I just have to think it through and that's the reason I read you that, prop that uh, syllogism. So with those points in mind, you are going to have to, if you are going to be faithful to the Lord every day, to decide, well, am I authorized to do this? Uh, take uh, a husband and a family. Do you know what the Bible teaches your role is? What's obligatory to you? The account you will give to God someday since you are a husband? Add to that a father. Same thing's true of a wife and a mother. The Bible addresses those roles. It tells you about how they are to be lived so as to be faithful in those roles to God. 
And it bothers me and has for a long, long time. Doesn't cause me to lose any sleep over it because I can only do what I can do. And beyond what I can do, I can't do. <laughs> uh, that people seemingly can read a scripture, know it's applied to them, and then they go on and get themselves involved in things and never realize, well, didn't you understand that that scripture implied this shouldn't be done or it should be done or it should be done a certain way? You see, virtually everything we have that wasn't around in the first century, then we know it's right or wrong by implication. Because it specifically and explicitly wasn't addressed in those days. But the truth that would have a bearing on it is here. And does that not tell you more why Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth? And the truth shall set you free or make you free, John 8, 31, 32. With that in mind, let me point out that the inspired apostle Peter, writing part of the New Testament, wrote to Christians. And he said this. First two verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1, 2 and 3, I should say, rather than the first through the third. Grace... And peace be multiplied unto you. Well, that's a wonderful sentiment, isn't it? I think it's great. I'd wish that on me, my family, you as brothers and sisters of the Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Not just to have it, but that it be multiplied. But now look at the rest of it. How does that happen? Well, you see that preposition through... That means that it travels through something. Here's the way that it's done. Here's the way it's grace and peace is going to be multiplied. It's through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now if you don't have the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, forget about grace and peace being multiplied unto you. It's just not going to happen. So the Bible's full of material about the proper attitude toward it and the importance of studying it and making the right application of the truth to your life in any given situation. So grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now watch. According. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. As his divine power. According as his divine power hath given unto us a few things. Most things. Doesn't say that does it. All things that have to do with, that pertain to, life and godliness. But notice how he ends the verse. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, I, I might say this. When he says, according to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And yet at the beginning of the passage, and at the end of it, he says that, this is all coming through the knowledge of the Word of God. Your knowledge of it, my knowledge of it, and putting it all into practice as it bears on our life. Do you realize that you, without doing any violence to the Scripture, can substitute gospel for divine power? Remember, Paul tells us in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, what does he say here? Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord or Jesus our Lord. And it's according as his divine power. Well, what's to be preached to every creature in order to save them? The gospel. Mark 15. Mark 60, 15. Well, then where do you get the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ? The gospel. For what are we to contend? The faith, another way of saying the gospel or the New Testament system. You see more even from here why you should contend for it. Because grace and peace is multiplied unto you through it. Through the knowledge. Through the gospel. Through the power of God to save us from sin. All of that is extended demand in becoming a Christian. 
and in living the Christian life, growing up in the family of God, spiritually speaking, through the knowledge. No wonder Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's like the terms the inspired writers use to refer to the realm of the saved. There's not just one term. You've got churches of Christ salute you. That is, the congregations of God's people, wherever they're located on earth, they salute you. Because the largest and smallest organized entity of the one universal church of Christ is in a location, a certain geographic location, such as the church in Jerusalem, Rome, Corinth, or here. You also have Paul addressing various congregations in a region, the churches of Galatia. And then you have specific churches addressed, such as the church at Rome. But they're all being supplied the same gospel, the same source of power, the same knowledge. And thus Paul would talk about what I preach in one place, I preach in all places concerning salvation. And thus if unity is to ever prevail in this congregation or anywhere else, everybody has to settle on what is the final rule of faith and practice that we appeal to to determine right and wrong. And if it's not the New Testament of Christ, where are you going to go? You'll do just what people have always done when you don't accept the Bible, and the Bible only is the only rule of faith, and specifically the New Testament of the Christ where his will is set out. Then you're going to begin to say, let's have councils and synods and conferences, and they'll produce prayer books, and they'll produce disciplines, and they'll produce... Whatever else from man, catechisms, to set out a standard. But we already have standard. It's obvious from what Peter, apostle of Christ, inspired of the Holy Spirit, said. If you're going to gain anything of Christianity, it's going to come through the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Which knowledge is only found in the Bible and specifically the New Testament. Now follow with me here and reason with me. If Christians are to have grace and peace multiplied unto them, it will be through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We've summed that up in what we said thus far. Furthermore, whatever the phrase, all things that pertain unto life and godliness means, we know the Christian gains it through the knowledge of him that calls us to glory and virtue. It behooves us then to understand the many component parts of all things that pertain to life and godliness. Because it's the scriptures that reveal them, and we'll see that here again in a moment. And it's through the knowledge of him that it called us to glory and virtue. And that's what the gospel did. When we heard it and understood it, it called us out of service to sin and self and separation from God by sin. And it called us to use some, uh, scriptural terminology and do his marvelous light. It called us into the light of truth. And it's his power to save, but it can't save if I won't let it save by not doing what he said and the way he said it for the reason he said it. That's how I obey God. There is no other way to obey God. And the writer of Ecclesiastes said, that's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. That's all that matters in life. Fear God, keep his commandments. That'll get you to heaven. Nothing else will. So that means you've got to spend a lot of time with your head in the book with the right attitude toward it as God's word and you're learning it so you can apply it to your life. Certainly Peter's writing to members of the church of Christ as that term is defined and used in the scriptures. And it's concerning their growth and development in all things spiritual. Now what's the end result of all of this? Well it means that uh, he wants people to remain faithful to the Lord and the church. He wants them in so doing no, to do so no matter what the deception, what the snares uh, are or what the trials are or what kind of tribulations come upon us because of our faithful obedience which Satan is going to place upon us. For we're already told all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Just expect it. You're going to become a Christian. You're going to be faithful. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God too, you know. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We're to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 
That means we walk as the word of God teaches, leads us, guides us, and directs us. Isn't that what Peter's saying? What we've already read? That's how the grace and Peter's, uh, peace is multiplied unto us. So Satan is going to place all these things before us. He's going to do what he can to put them against us. But we retain our integrity of being tenacious in holding on to the truth no matter what happens or what's done to us. That's ultimately then the way to heaven. That's what's called a straight and narrow way. And few there be that find it. So all of this that's written in the New Testament is designed to get men from earth to heaven. But this is written to those who've already heard the gospel. They believed it. From the heart they've obeyed it, Romans 6, 17, and 18. Now you have to persevere. Now you have to remain faithful. So this letter, as most of the letters are in the New Testament, are written to those who already believed in Christ and obeyed the gospel and are in Christ. Thus, they have to remain in Christ, faithful to Him. And that's what he's saying. Because Satan, I promise you, since he has everybody else, is after you and after me, if you're faithful. You realize that since... Most of the world is on Satan's side, even religions. That he doesn't have to concentrate on too many to try to get them turned away. It's just a few that he's concentrating on. Because it's just a few, and it's been that case throughout history, as far as faithful servants of God. It's always just a few in comparison to all of the people around about us that are remaining faithful. So you might as well expect him to zero in on you from time to time. Now what are you going to do? Bow your head and cry and say, I didn't expect this, and be a millennial Christian. Go whimper and whine. Goes, why did this have to happen to me? Well, that doesn't sound like anything you read in the Bible as far as what God says Christians ought to be. Read Ephesians 6. Put on a whole armor of God. Having done all to stand. That's no whimper there. Quit ye like men. Stand fast in the faith. Not stand up and, and put your will to the task to know and do God's will and nobody's going to turn you from it. Now notice uh, that the phrase, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, is parallel to what Paul wrote to Timothy concerning just exactly what the scriptures are meant to be able, and they can, do for you. Because he said, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, in 17, that the man of God may be perfect, that spiritually complete, thoroughly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's verse 17 of 2 Timothy 3. Isn't that what Peter said? Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what he said? And it's all according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us, knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Isn't that why we cite what Paul said to Timothy as to the position, the scriptures, the word of God has when it comes to us and knowing what's right and wrong? Now you do remember that little syllogism I read a while ago. Let me read it again at this time. Major premise. Faithful elders must watch over the souls of all Christians in the church under their oversight and all things pertaining to life and godliness. Bill and Betty are married Christians in the church under the oversight of a faithful eldership. Therefore, Bill and Betty are souls that must be watched over in all things pertaining to life and godliness by the elders of the church where they're members. Now, I challenge anybody to find that that syllogism is not valid and the premises are not true. And if the premises are true and the syllogism is valid, it's right. It's the truth. It's the way it is. It can't be challenged. It can't be changed. All you can do is say, I know it, but I don't care. It's not suit me. <laughs> you can do that, but you can do that on anything. You can do that on paying your taxes. I don't think I owe that much. But the facts say you do. I don't care. I'm not going to pay it anyway. Go ahead and do that. See how far that gets you in time. What do you think about the infallible Word of God? Improving all things, holding fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Having thus saith the Lord for everything you believe in practice. Appealing to the New Testament for your authority to act. Knowing that's the way that's right and cannot be wrong. But let me add you one to that. This is another one. Connects to the first one. 
major premise. Faithful elders must watch for the souls of married Christians in all things pertaining to life and godliness without usurping the headship of the husband. Bill and Betty are married Christians. Therefore, faithful elders must watch for the souls of Bill and Betty in all things pertaining to life and godliness without usurping the headship of the husband. Well, of course you wouldn't want to usurp the headship of the husband. That's the one that God set in this other institution, the home, to be the head of the house. But what if the head of the house is not living according to all things that pertain to life and godliness? What if the wife is not, and both of them are Christians now, mind you. They've heard the gospel, believed it from the heart, obeyed it, been added to the church, and Peter wrote to him when he wrote this. What if in all things pertaining to life and godliness, a husband or a wife, both Christians, are transgressing some of those things? Does the Bible say, elders, hands off? You can't touch them. You don't have shepherding powers there. Only the head of the house, who's not doing what God said in the first place, is transgressing God's law. Only the head of the house can tell what that, that place is going to do. That is, that institution, that home is going to do. But the head of the house is not being what the Bible says the head of the house ought to be. And they're Christians. Does the New Testament address at all what the head of the house is to be or the wife is to be? Well, certainly it does. It's part of all things that pertain to life and godliness. A husband who's a Christian must submit to God's authority in Christ in the New Testament to fulfill and be what the role says he ought to be. What is foreign to us about that? Why is that a new idea? It's only new sometimes because we've decided it applies to me and I don't want it to apply to me. That's exactly what it comes down to. And the same is true when it comes to wives. And you know it also has to do with children. What if mom and daddy aren't following the teaching of the New Testament regarding rearing their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? The elders can't say anything about that. Seems like to me they're obligated in watching for those souls, knowing what the will of the Lord is in husbands and wives and mamas and daddies and scriptures. They're obligated to say something about it. They're usurping nobody's authority. When they call to their attention, you're not in harmony with what God says Husband, wife, father, mother, or children ought to be. Or you're not doing what parents ought to do as the Bible says what ought to be. That's, as far as I know, things that pertain to life and godliness. Because the parents are to rear their children in what? The nurture and admonition of the Pope. They're to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Why do they don't do it? The elders can't say a word about it. Where did we ever learn such a thing? Why would we ever be driven to a point to take such a position? Sometimes it's just plain outright stubbornness. <laughs> That's just all there is to it. Sometimes people just don't know. Well, we can educate them. That's part of what this is all about. When you're taught as parents to rear your children a certain way, and it's not coming from the human mind, it's a revelation from heaven, in the Son's Last Will and Testament. And it'll read that way and mean that way on Day of Judgment. And parents will give an account as to whether they reared their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord or they didn't. Well, there's multiplicity of component parts in the rearing of children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, what are they? You think studying the Bible with them would be one of them? Praying with them? Making sure they come to the worship and the Bible classes? Making sure they're in every way possible, exposed to the good as the Bible defines the good, pointing out bad things to them, telling them that's not the way we do because the Bible doesn't teach us to do that way. And you can pick any specific thing that pertains to rearing children, the nurse and admonition of the Lord, or whatever's involved in uh, all things pertaining to life and godliness. And if you'll just sit down and take the time, you can make a list. It's not hard. Now, that's one reason last Wednesday night I said, the, and we took the time and deviated from our class, and Wednesday night I said, do you ever ask yourself the question, why we do what we do? Why do, you, why, why do you parents treat your children the way you treat them? What does rearing your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord mean to you 
as you teach them. We're all to be examples of godliness to everybody, one another, everybody else. What does it mean? What does that mean that I do specifically? What organizations does that mean I want to be a part of? And what organizations do I not want to be a part of? What do I want to keep my children out of? And what should I encourage them maybe to be in? And you know, there's very little you can be in nowadays except faithful in the church that doesn't have something pulling at you to go contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Do you think people think that way? I've already preached and so have other faithful preachers. We all know it. That we'll get so beside ourselves in getting our children a good secular education. We'll have to send them anywhere because they get this scholarship and that scholarship and all that. And we never think about what is the church like there? How much encouragement are they going to be to study their Bible and live righteous lives? I talked to a man years ago who went to uh, Berkeley. Was that University of California at Berkeley? You can't get more liberal than that. You can't get more wild-eyed than that. Those of us who grew up in the 60s know how they were the center of everything that was against anything that had been standard. <laughs> and he said, I went there to get my doctorate. And he said, as a gospel preacher, I knew I was walking into a hotbed. And he said, I resolved before I ever started my first class that if I, I would read my Bible daily, I'd study, I'd pray about it. And he was a mature man when he did this, so he wasn't a novice. But he said, I just decided if I heard anything in class that I knew went against what the Bible teaches, I would remember it, but I wasn't going to let it govern me and what I did. Because when you get in certain professional programs you know this is all a part of what will make you what they're going to turn out so he just said whatever turns out whenever I hear something contrary to the doctrine of Christ no I talked to another man who who went to a denominational school Baptist school and when they would give them tests they expected to get back what the Baptist teacher who usually was a preacher too, but had his academic credentials taught in the class. And that was the answer they expected on whatever the questions were on the test they were being given. So he said, how do I do this? I've got to show him I know the material, but I can't let the error stand. So he simply answered it the way the fellow wanted it answered, and out beside it, he answered it the truth with the scriptures. And he simply said, I know this is what you want, and here is what we were taught, but here is what the Bible says. <laughs> now, sometimes that works all right. Sometimes there's prejudice enough to put you in hot water. But sometimes in higher education, you have to do that. Well, brethren, you have to do that everything we do nowadays. The world around us, even the religious world, is not friendly to pure primitive New Testament Christianity and the godly families. It means then that we can't just see the world going to pot and our democracy falling to pieces and all of this, so we're going to run out and become a member of some sort of organization. Look, this is the best organization you can ever be a part of. It's the army of the Lord. You can't be a better part of an organization to do good in the church than to be a faithful member of the church of our Lord, to be a godly person, to be a Christian, put on the whole armor of God, to fight the fight of faith, to spread the gospel, to defend the faith, to live godly before the world. And if you can't do that and be a part of whatever it is you want to be a part of, you don't need to be a part of it. It's that simple. And it seems like we've got some people that can read this, tell you what it says, but when it comes to applying it to a given situation in a practical matter, they don't know what to do. They just divorce themselves completely from it. So, when you look at it's through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord that we have multiplied to us grace and peace. And when you see from 2 Timothy 3.17 that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. And it's all putting, pointing back to the scriptures and your proper knowledge of them. And you realize parents are to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Surely that points them back to the teaching of the Bible on marriage, on the roles of husband and wife, mother and father and children, and even divorce and remarriage. Does the Bible address that? 
Certainly it does. Does the world encourage you to have a Matthew 19, 6, God-joined marriage today? No, it says even two men can marry or two women can marry. And somebody may be married to a tree or a fence post or a jackrabbit. I don't know. When men are left to their own devices, you don't know where they'll end up. Read your Bible and you'll see that too. You know, history just simply goes right along with the Bible. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that's what happens to men when they are influenced by the revelation of God that has no influence on them. One of the multiplicity of component parts pertaining to life and godliness is that of the organization of the one church to which Jesus added all those he saves from their sins when they, of course, obey the gospel and being baptized to Christ. The gospel being God's power to save, and you're baptized for the remission of sins, having first believed in Christ, repented of your sins, and confessed your faith in him. And from the totality of the information in the New Testament concerning the organization of the one universal church, then we learn that the largest and smallest organized entity of that universal church is the local church, a church in a geographic location, as I've already mentioned, such as in Rome or Jerusalem, or not designated in the sense of the geographic location, such as Churches of Christ Salute You, or in a region such as the churches addressed in Galatia. When you see the organization of the church, then it's on that local level. And there are elders to oversee, and there are deacons to serve. There are preachers and teachers to convey the message of Christ. Elders are also known and referred to by the Bible as presbyters or pastors or bishops. And each term is describing the work they do in the church. The qualifications of these brethren are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Men who meet those qualifications and are appointed as elders have the authority of those elders. They are expected to police themselves. No one elder has any authority. It's the eldership that does. Therefore, they discuss and come to an agreement. And they are as one when they make that agreement. All of that's part of it. Now, you mean to tell me these people cannot have oversight in some area of a member that's under their oversight in all things that pertain to life and godliness, which would be the home and its organization and the functions of those in that home? Regarding the attitude of the members toward their responsibility to the elders, the inspired apostle Paul wrote, And we beseech you to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. 1 Thessalonians 5.12 You mean then elders can't admonish a husband when he transgresses and tells him to get back doing what God says in his word to do as a husband or a wife or a father or a mother or children? I've used this example a long time ago, but it was when my father was serving as an elder, and it must go back 30 years. But a lady whose husband was not a member of the church was bringing her boy, and he got to be a teenager, and he was bigger than she was, and he decided he wouldn't come into Bible study one morning and go stay in the car. And she was wringing her hands and all this stuff and came to the elders and said, what am I going to do about it? Well, have you made him come in? Have you taken him against his will and exercised your will over his will and made him come? Well, no, she didn't think she could do that. She needed some instruction on being a mother. She couldn't depend on her husband. So he stayed out in the car. Well, one of the elders went out and sat down with him and told him he was going to do what his mother said. That was his duty. If not, they'd be out to see him. I don't think anybody usurped in their authority. I think they helped her in her authority. They reminded her of her duty. Well, what are elders to do in those areas but that? If not, I don't know how you function. I don't know how you operate. I don't know what they're there for. I don't know their worth. So they told the lady as the eldership, not only is your responsibility to set a godly example before him, your responsibility while he is under your jurisdiction as his mother is to make him do even when he doesn't want to do when it comes to what's right. You know, it seems to me parents have forgotten that. They don't think they can make their children do anything. Well, I've never known any children that always like to do anything their parents said uh, at one time or another. There's always got to be something to do. You ever heard somebody say, grab them up by the scruff of the neck? Where do those thoughts come from? 
Well, it's not that all are equal as to the kind of discipline, corrected discipline needs to be met uh, out. Well, you don't have your children long. You may, those of you small children, you may think they're going to be there forever. No, no, no. They're going to be gone before you can turn around. They're going to be somebody's husband or wife, or you hope they'll marry and still live with them. Or you hope they will decide to marry if they're a boy, a girl, or a girl marry a boy. They may not. The world said you don't have to. Or you may see them at 30 and you look out the door and they're back and they brought somebody and several others with them. What are you going to do? There comes a time sometimes when you have to say, you're on your own. And if you're going to be this way in view of the teaching and training you got, then you can this, as my mother used to say to me, long head on. You see, we don't know what has been called the last 30, 40 years we don't really understand the exercise of tough love. Tough love says you have a personal responsibility that is not mine. And I've trained and taught you, if so, you have. And you're on your own now. You're big enough to know better than that. I don't know that we can say that anymore. But used to, you could. But what does it mean to say to somebody, you're big enough to know better than that? Well, it means all the time they were growing to that position, they were being taught, trained, and the example set before them. Well, there comes a time when if you choose to reject all those things, you just, as we say at home, you just have to belly up to the lick log and take the licks. You've got to learn to stand on your own two feet. You've got to learn to take on personal responsibility. You've got to learn to take on the consequences of the mistakes you made and not try to pass them on to everybody else. That's what maturity is. That's what being an adult is. When I was a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But Paul says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Not nowadays. You may be chronologically 30, but you haven't put away any childish things. You're still just as childish then as you were when you were 13 or younger. You see, being, having a godly home is a taught thing and a practice thing. Just like converting people to Christ is done by teaching and training in godly life. And having the church as God would have it comes through teaching and training and the impartation of knowledge. That's why Peter said what he did. That the word of God is what gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And why the church is organized like it is with elders when they're being what they ought to be. And the attitude of the members of the church toward the elders. That's the reason I said this, and this is not all of it, connects to what I said this morning. Must remember in the family of God, there's preventive discipline and there's corrective discipline. Preventive is the teaching and the training and showing the right way. Corrective discipline is when they've been taught what the right way is and they know it and they transgress it. And that discipline is to bring them back. And it goes so far as when they will not be taught after they sin, that if they will not change, they will not repent, then the church has no choice then, as I talked this morning, to mark and avoid. We'll talk more about this as time goes on. If you think of questions you'd like to have asked and didn't want to now, feel free to write them down or jot them down however you want to because there's a lot more I like to deal with. It covers different aspects. But it's all going to center on the fact that everybody who is a Christian is subservient to the authority of God in the order that he has set up in the New Testament for the governance of the church. Nobody is out from under that. And when the home is conducted, being the first God-ordained institution as God created it, then civil government, the principle of it, is next. And then the church is third. When they're all doing what God said do in the way it should be done and the reason, or if there's more than one reason, none of them usurp the authority of any other one. And so when elders oversee the different members of the church in their different capacities, if those capacities are set out in the New Testament with the roles taught, as to how they should conduct themselves. But they don't. They sin. Yes. Elders have a right to deal with them, to bring them back to the truth of the role they occupy as that truth 
is in Jesus and pertains to all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I'd hate to know as parents who are Christians that we do things in our home that doesn't pertain to all the life and godliness. You want to say that? Therefore, the elders don't have anything to do with us. You know, sometimes people get awful warped in their thinking. Well, that's possible. People do. For the life of me, some of them, I can't figure out why they do. They do what they claim to be. If you need to obey the gospel, we study what it takes to do so. If as a child of God you've sinned in repentance, confession of those sins and prayer to God is the way you gain remission of those sins once having become a child of God's sin. Thus, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.